I'm gonna do this one time and one time only. Isn't the power of video editing fun? Because this thing is made of foam. It does not squeak. And also, I do not know how long I'm gonna keep this headband on. It's originally for your neck, but it's like very tight. So anyway, hello everybody, and welcome back to my channel. I am Jen, and this is Fundy Fridays. And here on my channel, I talk about different aspects of Christian fundamentalism, American conservative politics, pop culture, and gay stuff! Woo! Yeah, I'm really excited. This episode today has a happy ending and there is gay people or at least affirming churches, which we love to see. So yeah, today I have donned clown garb. You know how I like to get really into the subject matter. If you haven't deduced, today we are talking about Christian clowning, otherwise known as Christian clowning ministries. We are going to talk about clown mass, which is both a metaphor and also a literal thing. And we're going to be talking about the clown father of modern Christian clowning, Floyd Schaefer, who he wrote the foreword to this book. He is not the author. The author is Janet Litherland, but we're going to be talking about him because he made an hour and a half long, like instructional video on how to be a Christian clown. And you might have seen clips of it online. Also shout out to Catherine's diary on TikTok. She was kind of the one that put Christian clowning like into the, into like the internet Gen Z, like TikTok arena. I, although I did buy this on Amazon and got it shipped in like two days because I honestly started this episode like last Thursday. So I didn't have a lot of time, but anyways, she actually offered to send me this book, her own book. And it wasn't going to get here in time, but anyways, I just wanted to say special shout out to her and God, where do we even begin? Obviously, if you are scared of clowns, this is not the episode for you. I'm sorry that you have clown phobia. Um, what is it actually called? <laughs> Coolerophobia, C-O-U-L-R-O phobia. It's not, apparently it's not specifically being afraid of them. Sometimes people just think they're creepy or weird or uncanny valley. I completely understand, but I usually never talk about my actual personal life, but I am not afraid of clowns because my grandfather was a Christian clown. He, more specifically, a Catholic clown for the Knights of Columbus, which now obviously this isn't technically true or technically the definition, but I think of the Knights of Columbus as the Catholic Masons. It's like a fraternal organization and sometimes they do charity work sometimes they have fish fries and sometimes they dress up as clowns and honestly not even why I was doing this episode I originally had like I really needed to put something out this week because I'm working on some other projects and they're gonna take a long time so I wanted to have some easy thing there ended up being so much information about the clowns that they got their own episode so anyways sorry if you're afraid don't watch it there's gonna be a lot of clowns I just wanted to share the joy. I get it. I understand why people think they're creepy. There's a lot of scary clowns in society. You know, you've got John Wayne Gacy, Pennywise, Ronald McDonald. Like, there's a reason. If you are legitimately a clown by either trade or hobby, please, please leave a comment. I need to know. Um, you know what would have been a funnier joke if I had said, if you are a clown by birth or by choice, because then I could also be like, a cab assigned clown at birth. <laughs> They're not even like, I don't see them very often. I think general society doesn't like them. I'm not saying that clowns are like a marginalized group, but like <laughs> they're just not very common anymore. And so I thought it was really funny that there is enough of this type of subculture that like there's books about it. Like, yeah, I... <laughs> It just, it just made me laugh. And that's the whole point of clowns, right? To make you happy. I know, I don't know the full history of clowns. I know that like modern day clowns are kind of derived from like jesters and people like that in ancient times and ancient. That there is a guy named Joseph Grimaldi and he had a character called Joey. And he's kind of seen as the 
first modern clown. At least he's like highly revered in England because a lot of these older clowns, especially like mimes and stuff, they obviously come from different parts of Europe. And so Joseph Grimaldi, he originated what is called whiteface, which no, I do not like saying that term. He is highly revered. I do believe he was like in the 1800s. So there's actually a yearly Grimaldi church service. And this is a celebration of his life. And it's a big gathering of clowns and non-clown people. I believe that is what they want to be called. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Clowns and civilians gather at this church. I forgot to mention that they have been gathering at this church to celebrate Joseph Grimaldi since 1946. That's why I'm bringing it up now because I'm trying to go into chronological order. It actually has a real name, Trinity Saints United. It's in Dalston in the UK and it is nicknamed the Clown Church because once a year on Joseph Grimaldi's birthday, they have this church service and celebrate his life, like I said. It's kind of crazy because it's, you know, a huge gathering of clowns at this church and they do a legitimate church service. And from what I have seen, the entire ministry team at this church are women and it seems like they're super open-minded I would hope it's a clown church they have a lot of different social programs that help people and I just think they're really neat um, but they also at this church have a museum in the back a clown museum they actually have one of Coco the clown's outfits and although I've never heard of him I'm sorry to this clown not only do they have one of his outfits but at the church I forgot to mention they have stained glass with a clown in it I'm not sure if that's supposed to be Joseph but come on that's pretty cool you know I love stained glass with shit in it that ain't supposed to be there. It's a real genuine church service in remembrance of Joseph Grimaldi, who is uh, revered as the first proper clown. Oh my God, can we talk about his name? It's amazing. Bibbledy Bob. And it's so British. Bibbledy Bob. Yeah, I'm a clown, mate. My name's Bibbledy Bob. And so the, our grandfather of clowning. Um, and so... Every year, the first Sunday in February, we gather at All Saints Church in Haggerston, London, and clowns come from all over the world. If COVID taught us anything is that um, life can be deadly serious, but also it can be really funny. And so for us, we're at the funny end of this operation. We like people to smile. We like people to laugh. We like people to enjoy life because at times it is far too serious. So that's where we're at. We're at the smiling end. Oh yeah. <laughs> Honestly, this is such a bucket list thing. Like, if I ever make it to the UK, I have to go see the Cloud Church. Like, I just have to. Like, there's something so genuine and sweet about it. Anyway, here's another clip from a different documentary about this um, Grimaldi Clown Church thing. And I don't really know where it comes from, but I really liked the clip. So I hope you enjoy it too. Well, it's unusual because it's uh, it's non-sectarian and it's uh, to praise the gift of laughter. So you get a lot of people coming to the church service that wouldn't go to a clown's convention because it has a religious aspect to it. It's really lovely to be able to make people laugh. It's a very important quality. The humour is a very special part of life, which we very difficult to find these days. And I've... Uh, I thank God that I have it still after 35 years. <laughs> It's just an, a wonderful service and it is, it, it is about bringing that sense of fun and joy into the act of worship. 
God will yet fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouts of joy. Job 8.21. I ain't going anywhere near that one. But when I was looking up this stuff, I kept coming across this thing called a clown mass. And these allegedly took place in the 60s and 70s, and obviously they're still happening today, but the main bulk of what I'm about to refer to is talking about that time period. And also, it is a little confusing for two reasons, which I will get into in just a second, but the main reason is that there are two different things that are referred to as clown masses. Actual church services that are conducted by clowns, and it's also a derogatory term for a mass that has gotten out of hand or has things that people find offensive like clowns, puppets, etc. A lot of the discourse surrounding these clown masses was like by these online trad calves. It's just a lot of these like really conservative Catholics who are like horribly offended and they think it's super sacrilegious to do anything silly or mess with the liturgy at all and you know, I can understand that. Like, if this is a serious religious ceremony and a serious religious tradition, you probably shouldn't get silly with it. But I I like fun and joy, and I think that Christianity should be happy and joyful. What I'm trying to say is there is no right or wrong answer to this clown mass situation. Like, especially when we're talking about literal clowns in literal church, I'm saying that I completely understand the idea that it is sacrilegious and offensive because if this was any other religion, would it be okay to insert clowns and puppets and rock concerts? I can't say, but I just wanted to tell you my opinion, which is I think it's fine, but remember I'm an atheist and, and now I guess a third generation clown. Catholic churches were doing clown masses. Like they would have a regular church service and they would wear the wig and do the whole thing and be silly. It almost became like an urban legend. And I'll show you what I mean on screen. Like people being like, did these really happen? Is there any proof? Which to me, I'm thinking, yeah, there's probably not going to be a lot of proof because if this was happening in like the 60s, 70s, like even 80s and 90s, unless you remembered to bring your camera that day to church, like you weren't going to catch it. But a lot of people think they were myths, but there were a few legitimate Catholic clown masses and people didn't like them. Take, for example, this Catholic clown mass. I actually have zero information about this thing except for the date, uh, September 1st, 2002. And apparently it's at 9.38 a.m. Because a lot of times when these people will complain about clown masses, they'll be like, well, do you remember this? This archbishop of this specific parish did it. And this one doesn't have any information. So what's important about it is that they're trying to conduct a clown mass and then someone gets up and says, this is sacrilegious. And then they argue and I can't actually hear what he's saying, but this priest seems to do good crowd work. You know, historically the most important name among professional clowns is Joseph Grimaldi. Now Grimaldi lived in the early part of the 19th century and every clown for 150 years- Sacrilegious! What? Yeah. Oh, there are people yeah. Now, you may think that's part of the routine, but it's not. <laughs> if people feel that, just let us know. But I think we're trying to share the gospel. Uh, now a clown mass is kind of a metaphor about a Catholic mass that's kind of gone off the rails or gets too evangelical. Or I've seen someone say, oh, it's a clown mass if a woman is leading it. Like, okay. You're a clown mask. Anyway, <laughs> like people refer to it in like the derogatory, you know, like, oh, what a clown mask. It's kind of like calling something uh, a kangaroo court, you know, like around the globe, the sacrifice of the mass for the past half century has been celebrated with the awe and beauty of Tupperware party held at a gymnasium. However, the mentality of the clown mass is the same behind the banal ugliness that affects the church today in regards to the mass. A loss of the sense of sacredness and awe that we should surround everything we do at mass as we worship the creator of the universe okay all right so if we go back to the 60s in our little timeline we have to talk about the movie parable which actually was the inspiration for the 
movie Godspell, which we will be talking about in just a second. So Parable is a 1964 American short Christian film written and directed by Rolf Forsberg, made for the Lutheran Council, and it became popular when first screened at the 1964 New York World's Fair. It was actually shot in 1964 at the Circus World Museum in Baraboo, Wisconsin, and it's actually really short, and it depicts Christ as a clown and the world as a circus, and is considered both a revolutionary Christian film and one which proved to be influential. It has been selected for preservation by the National Film Registry, by the Library of Congress, and I keep seeing that it was controversial, and I can't really see why besides just, you know maybe people thinking it's sacrilegious to depict Christ as a clown, but yeah, okay. Upon further inspection, I think I can see why this film was controversial. So in this thing, God is depicted as this puppet master at this circus, and he literally will like hang people by strings like a marionette, and he actually kills slash crucifies metaphorically this scary Jesus clown and it's like really upsetting and really scary. So you're never going to guess what happens next. Um, the God character, I guess his name is actually Magnus, according to Wikipedia. After this horrible uh, puppet crucifixion scene, he actually smears white clown makeup on his face to represent the uh, resurrection and transformation, I guess. Um it's very weird. And then you see Jesus, um, not sure if he's the original or this Magnus guy, but you see him riding on a donkey. And um, I guess that's supposed to <laughs> mean something. I'm not sure. Christian clowning really started in the 60s, but it didn't gain popularity until the 80s, although they did a little pit stop in the 70s, and that's even mentioned in this book. This book is amazing, by the way. It's about two thirds about balloon animals and makeup and like specific skits and sermons you can do to bring people to Christ, but it also has like some history in it. But they mentioned this, this movie I'm about to mention called Godspell, which is... Kind of in the same vein, it's a Christian rock opera like Jesus Christ Superstar. Jesus and John the Baptist and all his disciples and they're in New York City and they're acting out um, the Gospel of Matthew, but like in really abstract ways. And then they will take their place in eternal punishment, but the righteous shall have eternal life. Come on! <laughs> 
And anyway, so the, the way that it becomes clownish is because there is a scene where Jesus is putting makeup on one of his disciples and it's kind of like, kind of like what I did. It's like an interpretation of clown makeup. They're not doing the full white and the, the big exaggerated lips. They just have like drawings and cute things all over their face and they wear kind of mismatched clothing and they're kind of, you know, hippies and they'll act out some of the parables and like pretend to be the characters, but they also sang. There was actually a song that became a hit single off of this movie. And that is called day by day. day, by day. I'm not sure which version of the song became the hit single day by day is actually, I believe it would be referred to as the refrain in the musical. Like they sing it throughout the whole movie and it's actually really catchy and I really like it. Day by day. day, by day. All right, everybody, you know, when I find out more information about something, I have to tell you. So of course I looked up day by day on Wikipedia and found out that it comes from the 1971 stage musical version of Godspell and it has been covered by a bunch of different people and I'll get into that in just a second. In 1972 a version of the song from the album Godspell 1971 by the original off-Broadway cast was released as a single in the U.S. and attributed simply to the group named Godspell. The reason why I was confused for a minute was because the movie came out in 1973. Robin Lamont was the lead singer, uncredited. Day by Day spent 14 weeks on the Billboard Hot 100, peaking at number 13 on July 29th, 1972. Billboard ranked it as the number 90 song for 1972. And I listened to the version of the song that's on this album that's on Spotify, and it sounds exactly like the one from the movie. So I'm not sure if anybody that was in the movie actually sang. It sounds like they got all the music from the stage musical version. Then I went down to the fun facts portion of the Wikipedia page and lots of people covered it including DC Talk also fun fact Kevin Max has deconstructed and he follows me on Instagram so yeah Apparently, Ben Stiller's character in Meet the Parents recites the lyrics to this song as he's doing Grace, and apparently it also gets a reference in Wet Hot American Summer. Either way, it is, in my opinion, a God-honoring bop. All right, now let's talk about the money shot. Let's talk about the crucifixion, right? So I have watched this scene a couple times, and I do not understand what is killing Jesus here. I almost, I wonder if it's like a metaphor for something else that, that I'm not understanding. Like, now obviously I don't need to see blood and guts here, but if you didn't know, if you didn't know that this was supposed to be a crucifixion, like, I don't really understand. He's just, he, he's just standing there menacingly and then he dies. This music is kind of awesome though. Am I, am I wrong? Like, like guitar goes hard. Spoiler alert if you haven't finished the Bible, but Jesus does die, at least temporarily. This kind of has an ambiguous ending. They don't show Jesus like ascending to heaven, but they do the the clown disciples. They carry his body through New York City and then they kind of disappear in the crowd. But you'll never guess what song they're singing as they do this. Oh, Lord, I pray. God, this song is catchy. Day by day. Also note, Victor Garber, who plays Jesus, he actually got his start in this movie. You might recognize him as the creepy professor from Legally Blonde. And also the captain on the Titanic. Does he just play like bad guys? Well, Jesus isn't a bad guy. Also, there's an actress in this movie named Lynn Thigpen. To bless his holy name. I don't know what else she's been in, but you might recognize her as the time cop in Where in Time is Carmen Sandiego. Hello and welcome to Acme. I'm the chief, but you can call me, well, the chief. 
We're in the business of tracking down thieves, and we're ultimately after one. Carmen San Diego. Every creep we've ever collared has been working for her. Okay, so R.I.P. Lynn Thigpen. She died in 2003, and according to her Wikipedia, she was a practicing Methodist and a lifelong liberal Democrat. In addition, she never married nor had any children due to the fact that she had no desire to have those titles in her life, same as having to carry along the commitments that came with them. And she voiced Luna the Moon in Bear in the Big Blue House. Like... Wow, what an incredible person. Like I said, look at that. That's kind of clowny that it's falling off my head. Whoop. Oh, it's caught on my pigtails. Let's just take it off. Let's just, ow! Ow! So in the 80s, there was a bunch of nuns who decided to try out Christian clowning. And they are the sisters of Mount St. Benedict out of Erie, Pennsylvania. They are known for being really cool and like liberal for nuns. And they do a lot of social justice work. They are constantly protesting different things. Things that, that we would probably all agree with, uh, like Black Lives Matter or... I didn't want to show any of the modern pictures of these nuns because I wanted to protect their privacy as best I could. But there was a lot more causes that they're super active about, like gun violence, children in cages at the border, climate change, anti-war... All that good stuff. But famously, they started doing Christian clowning in the 80s. And one of them was named Bubbles. And she's still alive. And I actually found her on the nun directory. And if I had more time, like, I really should have planned this out better. I would have emailed her because um, you can email all of them nuns. All right. So this is an archived article from the Los Angeles Times from 1987. Erie, Pennsylvania, at Mount St. Benedict, an unobtrusive priory where nuns pray and preach for peace and justice, the expression of faith often takes a colorful, circus-like twist. The Benedictine sisters of Erie are fools for Christ, goodwill ambassadors in clown outfits who spread and celebrate the gospel through gentle humor and mercifully tender tricks. The traditional Christian message seems to get boxed in. What we attempt to do is break down some of those barriers, said Sister Peggy Peluski, otherwise known as Bubbles. There is an underside, and you can laugh in the context of prayer, she said, showing off her yellow clown outfit and antenna. It's okay. It's a part of the human experience, as well as being stern and very solemn-faced. It's important not to take life too seriously said beth adams a, a postulant whose trademark is garish suspenders and a yellow back scratcher for a religious order who protests for peace justice and women's rights have stretched from the steps of erie's courthouse to the white house donning clown costumes and painting faces for special services retreats and benevolent outings is a particularly welcome change of pace it's real easy to go from one vigil to the next Sister Anne McCarthy said, You can easily get stuck in a position where you're saying no all the time. No, we shouldn't bomb Libya. No, we shouldn't fund the Contras. No, we shouldn't be involved in Central America. No, we shouldn't be building this weapon system. To see the same group have clowning as a part of prayer and a part of worship integrates it. It all ties together. But I don't think people always put those together, and I think it's good for them to see. In fact, the nuns' liberal views and frequent demonstrations have made their venture into clowning that much easier, at least as far as public acceptance is concerned. Only a a handful of Mount St. Benedictine's 150 nuns were habits. The rest wear everyday clothes to their jobs on and off the 60-acre priory, located seven miles from Erie along Lake Erie's shore. Our community in general receives a lot of criticism for various things we do. This clowning is the least of them, said Sister Carolyn Gorney Kapowski, or Mumsy. Her comment prompted a burst of laughter from her clowning cohorts. I've had different people say, boy, you're the happiest bunch of nuns I've ever seen, a grinning sister Paula Burke added, generating still more laughter. Mount St. Benedictine's efforts are part of a new resurgence in clowning, mime, storytelling, and other art forms in all religions, said Georgia Davis, executive director of Phoenix Power and Light, a nonprofit group that holds annual clown ministry conferences. Church clowns are not just clowning around. The contemporary clown ministry movement dates back to the 60s, although the concept has been around since the time of Christ, regarded by practitioners as the ultimate fool for sacrificing his life for others. In 1985, the National Conference of Catholic Bishops Committee 
Committee on the Liturgy denounced clown ministry as inappropriate in liturgical worship. I wonder if they did that to try and like stomp out the clown mass rumors. The panel statement appears to have had little effect on those who consider clowning a legitimate alternative to presenting religion more traditionally. The fad of it may have reached a peak, but the depth of it has not, said Margie Brown, who teaches clown ministry at the Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley. Mount St. Benedict's nuns were hoping to enrich their spiritual lives when they formed their clown troop nearly four years ago after attending a national clown ministry conference. Their decision to add clowning to their endeavors didn't come easily, even though they were no strangers to the stage and had long since shrugged off obscurity. Members of the Priory appeared in full habit on Ed Sullivan's television show in 1966 as Sister 66, a singing group. They shared the program with the Rolling Stones. I wonder if I can find that. So I looked high and low and I could not find, in an obvious way, these nuns on the Ed Sullivan show. But I think I might have found them. And if not, because the comments section of this video are saying, oh, I knew them out of Erie, Pennsylvania, right? I'm hoping this is them because that's really cool. But they, you know what I mean? They were not labeled as the Sister 66, so it was hard to find. But this might be them. I'm hoping maybe. Please join with us. Someone's laughing, Lord. Someone's laughing, Lord. Oh, my heart. The nuns were back in the national spotlight in 1980 when faced with soaring fuel costs, they struck natural gas in their backyard. I feel like we need a little more info about that. Despite their unconventional past, some of the more conservative nuns in the 130-year-old Benedictine order had severe reservations about their colleagues performing as clowns, according to Paluski. Even as a smaller group, we questioned whether or not clowns belonged in chapel, whether clowns belonged in the setting of a liturgical worship. She said, we worked through those questions as a group. When should we clown? When should we mime? Is there a difference? After considerable debate, the Priory agreed to give clowning a try. About eight nuns immediately volunteered, adopting the name Fools on the Hill, borrowed from a song by John Lennon and Paul McCartney. The clowns made their debut at a birthday party for Sister Joan Chittister, Mount St. Benedict's Prioress, on April 26, 1983. Over the next year, they gathered regularly to practice miming as well as dramatizing parables based on Bible stories. Before long, the clowns were participating more and more at daily prayer services services as well as at weekend retreats enacting rather than enacting rather than reading the scripture their performances soon were expected even anticipated now for example the nuns all run to chapel to get a good seat when they learn the clowns will be performing according to burke the clowns occasionally escort the other nuns into the chapel in brightly colored costumes skipping down the aisle to circus music blowing bubbles through wands and handing out balloons and flowers but the mood turns calm and meditative once prayer begins because of the nuns expanding repertoire requests have begun streaming in from the outside. So far, the clowns who number 19 have held public workshops and have traveled throughout western Pennsylvania to homes for the elderly, state environmental conferences, and relief centers for tornado victims. They charge no admission but do accept donations. One of their latest efforts, a Vesper service in mid-October at a home for senior citizens 60 miles south in Hermitage, brought smiles and occasional tears to a sea of tired faces. In addition to handing out cards entitling the bearers to free hugs and twisting balloons into animals and apples, the nuns presented their own light-hearted interpretation of the creation. In the skit, God gives Adam first a cow and then a duck to keep him company, but the animals can't play catch with him, so God creates Eve, a union that the miming nuns conclude is very good. For Noreen Benedict, a postulant, it was a first attempt at clowning, serious clowning that is. I used to clown to get myself out of trouble, she said, giggling and twirling her yellow visor after the service. Now it comes from a different angle. It's totally from the heart. It's putting on a mask, but taking off another mask. Deep down inside, there's a clown in everybody, said Sister Carolyn Lang, who calls herself Ling Lang. You're touching something deep down inside of them that may somehow want, that may somehow want to come out, and a person doesn't know how to get that out. You're giving that person permission to go along with you and what you're doing. Almost always, it's a group effort. We see ourselves as working together, police. Lusky said. Even the personal satisfactions are shared. It's a very affirming experience no matter what we do or where we go, Sister Jennifer Ritter said. It's like we give it our best and people are appreciative. 
The group probably would be less successful with a more traditional ministering approach, according to Chittister. These sisters of ours are not doing slapstick. They're doing genuine human exploration of feelings, she said. It's designed to strip away all pretense and past explanations. You can't achieve this kind of simplicity any other way. Despite the growing demand for their services, the clowns have had to turn down invitations because of their already full schedules, teaching at Erie St. Benedict Academy, running a food bank and soup kitchen, and working at the Priory. They've also taken care not to let their appearance interfere with their struggle for peace and justice, even though they view the two efforts as being closely intertwined. I see it as a sign of hope in a sometimes hopeless world, Pelusky said. Somehow we turn around and laugh and say, hey, life is worth living. Our life is worth living and so is yours. And I want to share this bit of happiness and hope with you. That's the Christian message I feel. Something I really appreciate about this book is just how like serious these things are taken. I know we're talking about serious and silliness, but the people that do this, they're not doing it ironically. They're not doing it to like mock God. They truly love clowning. It's, it's their hobby. It's their passion. And they happen to be devout Christians. And although we we're going to encounter some Christian clowns today that are a little more conservative than I would want them to be. Most of them are like, you can't force people to receive the gospel. Basically, your job is to show God's love, to demonstrate God's love by making people happy um, and just being nice to them, being kind to them. So I wanted to talk about the Bible verses that are used to justify Christian clowning. Okay, and they talk about it in this book. 1 Corinthians 4.10, which is, we are fools for Christ's sake. 1 Corinthians 1.27, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And Psalm 102, serve the Lord with gladness. It is also justified by pointing to ancient paintings depicting Christ as a clown, or by revealing the humor of God, or by noting the modern perception of Christ functioning as a clown, searching for reality in a surrealistic world, as in the rock musical Godspell and the film The Parable. Whether on a stage, in a parade, or a street corner, in a circus, at a birthday party, or on the front steps of the church, the clown is recognized universally as a symbol of happiness. He creates smiles, he creates laughter. He stands for good. He knows no strangers, offers only kindness. He has no prejudice, offers only understanding. He cares. Does this sound like a ministry? Clown ministry isn't just entertainment, nor is it preaching in costume. It is a means of touching souls, something most clowns somehow manage to do. Perhaps all clowns, whether or not they realize it, are involved in ministry. Many who choose to be clowns have had rough beginnings or hard times in their lives. Laugh, clown, laugh, though your heart is breaking, is the theme of Leon Cavallo's opera, Pagliacci, and is often the theme of life. To those who smile through tears, the urge to clown grows out of the recollections of difficult periods, not from a need to hide or cover up, but from a need to share. These clowns say, I've been here, I've hurt too. I understand, I love. This is um, from page 10, and I think that you guys will really appreciate it. A clown is asexual, interracial, and ageless. He can touch at one time all ages, all intellects, all strata of society. The living and the dying. Instant communication. He encompasses all human emotion and expresses it in a big, exaggerated way, showing his beloved audience that they might let it all out, too, and feel better for it. In this way, he is a healer. By disclosing his own weakness, he risks himself knowing not whether he will be praised or plagued, cheered or heckled. He is vulnerable to his audience, and he can be trusted. He said their space is intact and they are comfortable with it. More space, of course, is needed for strangers, less for lovers. The clown knows about and respects personal space with extreme sensitivity. And then this part I also really enjoyed. Joy, faith, hope, or love cannot be forced upon other persons. Children are sometimes afraid of clowns and there are some other types of folks who just don't want to be bothered. Thus, these elements are presented so that persons may discover or at least believe that they are discovering for themselves. The fun is in the finding, the anticipation. In cases involving frightened children, the clown often aids them in discovery by acting as if he too is afraid. He takes fear upon himself and becomes the mirror, the echo, the means of release. The carrying clown waits and allows the children to come to him. <laughs> Never touch the clowns. Let the clowns touch you. The clown minister has faith in God, humanity, and himself. He conveys this great faith in some measure to every soul he touches. By presenting faith and offering trust, he shows us that he is willing to share the trust of others. He offers a place to cast thy burden. Notice that the clown never interrupts the girl's space. He waited until she moved into his space. Through love, the clown helps us die a little. You know, die to the self so that our lives may be filled with better things. There is a lot of love in the world, but too few are able to express it, particularly the no-strings-attached kind of love. Love is amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. 
Though this is not to say that the clown is all seriousness. The opposite is true. It is, though, the vehicle of laughter that he functions, and it is through laughter as necessary to life as breath itself that we are able to reach out and grasp the brass rings he offers. The clown minister gives a little tug at rigid traditions, bending them just enough to put them in touch with humanity. Strange, isn't it? The qualities that are the earmarks of a, of a successful clown, faith, hope, and love, seem to be ingredients of a happy life. The clown embodies 1 Corinthians 13.13. 13. So faith, hope, love abide, these three. But the greatest of all these is love. And that's true. God is love and clowns are God. Wait, that's not right. It was in 1964. I was doing a Bible study in, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And while leaping through some books over on the beach, I discovered that the word clown came from the Anglo-Saxon word clod. My mind immediately began to put together some rather humorous pictures because no matter how you interpret the opening chapters of Genesis, it comes out the same way. God loved a clod, took a clod, and had people come. It, it began a journey as I began to discover more and more about the use of the word clod was almost the same as the word that Jesus Christ used for servant. And I began to draw some rather strong connections between Jesus' command to be a servant and what that meant. I found out some symbolism of the clown, the white on the face being the death mask, the colors being the symbol of life, and every clown's face a message of Easter, that we're on a journey from death to life. From then on, it just grew. We began to do a few things, and I was good friends with Jerry Gothi at that time and a lot of other folks, and Jerry and I got together and we decided that uh, I'd lead a class. I sounded the call in the community and had, including myself, 12 people came to a class Jerry Gothi and I sat down in a half hour. We planned a progression of movement for a six-week course, giving people a new look at theology in a way that it can be lived out and enjoyed instead of being so glum and gloomy and solemn as much of the church has become. Okay, so that was Floyd Schaefer, no relation to Francis. And he not only wrote the foreword to the clown book that I was reading, which, by the way, I picked up the sequel, Everything New and Who's Who in Clown Ministry. And it's literally like biographies about different Christian clowns and, of course, um, 75 skits. And then, speaking of Floyd Schaefer, this just came in the other day. I haven't even had time to read it, but it's called If I Were a Clown. It's like almost like, I don't know, just like a nice, thoughtful read. It's not necessarily instructions on how to be a Christian clown. It's got like, if I were a clown, I'd laugh with God. I'd be a child when I grew up. I'd see comedy in life. I'd choose my mask wisely. I'd transform the simple and common. I'd do something intentionally foolish each day. I'd leave my act like the Lone Ranger. I'd make the dance a way of life. I'd give everyone in the world a big, big balloon. Like, it's just like, I don't know. It reminds me of, like, kitchen soup for the clown soul. What the fuck is kitchen soup? You know I meant chicken soup. Like, it's just, like, some nice stories and stuff. But it does have a little bit of information that I didn't know about Floyd. He is well known to church groups and other audiences across the country through his pioneering work in clown ministry. The pastor of a Detroit congregation, he has performed his ministry as Sakataco the Clown before more than 40 Christian denominations. He has been featured in Time, Newsweek, and PM Magazine and has appeared in three religious films. And I could not find him on IMDb, so I don't know what films these are. This was published in 1984... Just a cool little sweet book about Christian clowning and the Floyd's musings in on life and clowning. Okay, so it's your all's lucky day because I found an article about Floyd Schaefer that has newspaper clippings too. So here he is in black and white and then... Here's a little bit more about him. Though he may not have invented the form, Floyd Schaefer became, for a time, perhaps the most prominent and beloved proponent and practitioner of religious clowning in America. Born in 1930, the kindly and gentle Schaefer was a devout, deeply sincere Lutheran minister whose career trajectory took him from Michigan to Maryland to Ohio. In fact, Schaefer experienced his greatest period of productivity and prominence in the Buckeye State during the Reagan-Bush years. But to appreciate this man's full story, we must travel back to the age of Aquarius. Destined to become a literal holy fool, Floyd Schaefer started upon his unusual path in the late 1960s in Columbia, Maryland. 
where he preached God's word at the still existing Abiding Savior Lutheran Church. It was at this church that Schaefer first introduced costume clowning into his ministry and encouraged others to follow his example. According to his fellow religious clown, John Garrett, Floyd was aligning himself with a liturgical tradition stretching back to the Middle Ages when so-called holy interrupters would lighten the mood of formal services with their comedic outbursts. We're going to see an example of one of those later. Although a keen student of clowning history, Schaefer was more likely influenced by the counterculture of his own time. Clowning and mime were art forms beloved by hippies who also had a penchant for face painting and the donning of colorful garish clothing. Back in 1969, a preacher dressed as a clown could almost be considered edgy or hip. In those early years, Schaefer and his ilk were not always welcome among mainstream Christians. The soft-voiced pastor related to his followers the story of his disastrous appearance at a 1970s youth conference held at Houston's famed Astrodome. There, Schaefer and his fellow beneficent buffoons were regarded with extreme skepticism, thinking the clowns were blasphemous. The other conference attendees derided and in some cases attacked Schaefer's troop. Arlene Trapp, an original acolyte of Schaefer, recalled being treated like Jesus, kicked at, hit, and mocked. Oh yeah, they were really um, persecuted like Jesus. Still in all, Schaefer's tomfoolery-based evangelism must have yielded positive results in those early days because he kept at it. In 1974, still based in Columbia, he founded Faith and Fantasy, a non-denominational clown ministry popular enough to have lasted into the 1990s. Though its alumni remember it as a loosely aff affiliated non-organization whose members were never keen on rules, during those years determined to spread the message of Christ through the techniques of Emmett Kelly and Marcel Marceau, Schaefer and his followers performed Formed their wordless mime-based act at a weekly Lutheran service and also visited numerous hospitals, nursing homes, where they found an appreciative, if captive, audience for their antics. So in the 80s, he really got picked up by a bunch of different news places like the Christian Science Monitor and the Weekly World News Piece. Then he wrote his books, If I Were a Clown and Clown Ministry in 1984, and then Clown Ministry Skits for All Seasons in 1990. The book was accompanied by a 92-minute instructional video that decades later was, was widely excerpted and mocked on video sharing sites like E-Bombs World, God, remember that, Daily Motion, and YouTube. This article, or blog, should I say, uh, was written in 2020, and this thing is referencing 2006. Um, currently, if he's alive, he would be 94. Floyd Schaefer has returned to his home state of Michigan, where he lives with his wife. The couple have two grown children. Though no longer clowning, Floyd Schaefer is still a loyal follower of the Lutheran faith. And then apparently, recently, there's been found footage of him in this one movie, which nobody knows the name of, but it might be for the congregation. I don't know, but this is him in the movie from the 70s. Obviously, I wish I could watch that. And then here is him as a young man. And then more news articles. But anyway, what I really brought you here for is to talk about his instructional tape that is now online. It's an hour and a half long, and it's all about everything you need to know about Christian clowning, and we're going to go over it a little bit. Some folks might think that clown ministry is a contradiction. They feel that clowns are the exclusive property of parades, birthday parties, and, of course, the circus. The very thought of clowns engaging in acts of ministry, such as visits to nursing homes and hospitals, Sunday schools, outreach programs, ministry to the deaf, ministry with differently abled people, and yes, even worship, are beyond the wildest imagination. Yet these and many more ministries of clowns have circled the world and are reaching hundreds of thousands of people. There are Christian clown groups in over 40 different Christian denominations. And I have no idea when this video came out. He makes reference to South African apartheid in it. So um, it had to have been when that was happening. You'll find them in South Africa, where blacks and whites sometimes even clown together. You'll find them in India, where missionaries use the clown to help reinforce Bible stories. You'll find them in South America, Korea, Australia, across Europe, who knows where. I love when he just randomly changes camera angles. Clowning is much more than dressing up and putting on skits. We're dealing with basic communication of the gospel. It's the old biblical story, but it's told in ways that we've not heard it before. In our theology, I have three basic points. The first one is, God has a sense of humor, laughs, and delights. This isn't quite the way we normally picture God. So often we picture God as being grim or even angry and extremely long-faced. Yet the scripture brings to us the concept that God has a sense of delight and that he has given this gift to us as human beings and we also have that opportunity to laugh and delight with him. 
The second point in our theology is that God is not rational, eh, at least by human standards. Look at Abraham and the way God chose him and set him off to a promised land without even the benefit of a triptych. And then read the book of Judges and you begin to see some real humor emerge as you look at the judges Samson and Jephthah who was a bandit and Gideon. Let your imagination go for just a few moments and you'll see what I mean. Here is Gideon with 300 rather ill-trained troops and the Lord tells him to arm them with a clay pot, a flaming torch, and a horn, and he is to surround these 15,000 Midianites and break the pot, wave the torch, blow the horn, and beat them. And when you look at the unlikely prophets, you discover Ezekiel, who's seeing wheels up in the air and kind of makes you wonder what he was doing, doesn't it? And one of the most unlikely evangelists of all time was Jonah, who doesn't even want to convert the people he's sent to convert. Look at the way Jesus Christ called the Twelve. There was absolutely nothing logical or rational about it. And there's nothing rational about the way God calls you and me. So we have to come up with a word that describes it. And I've chosen the word transrational. Transrational? I can get behind that. That means that God goes above and beyond all the human logic of this world and in so doing releases his grace to us and enables us to function in a truly remarkable way. Point three, God uses the principles of comedy in history. Comedy is a process in which things are perceived in one way, are brought down, and through the intervention of a non-heroic character, are raised up to new and wonderful heights. I'm dying at this cardboard whale they got eating this clown Jonah. I love this video so much. As we begin to probe the various characteristics of a clown, we are led to ask some questions, what is a clown like? One of the first things that Jesus tells us about is that we ought to become like children, that we ought to have a sense of childlikeness. And we also know that clowns are very childlike. He also says that Jesus wanted us to be childlike and be in touch with our sense of imagination and whimsy. Imagination seems to beget imagination. That's why two clowns working together make a fantastic team. For what the one does seems to stimulate the imagination of the other. Two clowns working together to make a fantastic team. I can't think of a better description of me and James than that, I'll tell you what. Next, when you enter the nursing home, do not stand there with your group in a large cluster of clowns. Clowns can look rather intimidating if you see a lot of them in one place. Oh my God, <laughs> that old man, I'm so sorry, that is too funny. Be sure to choose a partner. Two clowns together are really great. If you attempt to make visits with three or four, you outnumber the person so much that they may feel a bit uneasy. Now he's teaching us about fun games that you can play with balloons or other random pieces of trash. Spike the balloon and knock this lady over at the nursing home? The elderly really receive you quite well. I think it's because they already know how vulnerable they are. They're lonely and they long for touch. So as clowns, we take seriously what Jesus said in Matthew 25. I'll put this in my own words. If a person is hungry, you feed them. If they're thirsty, you give them something to drink. And here I add my own words. If they're in need of touch, you touch them. If they're in need of a smile, you give them a smile. And then he shows us how to apply makeup. It's time for the powder now. Simply take the powder bag full of baby powder and pat it all over the makeup. Don't wrinkle your brow or squint your eyes or you'll leave some greasy lines when the powdering is done. When you're done, let it stand for just a few seconds. And then take a brush and brush off the excess powder. Can somebody give me like one good reason why this should not be considered drag? I'll finish my costume and when I'm done, I think I'll do one of the first sermons that I ever did as a clown. It's based on 1 John 3.18. This is so Tim and Eric, it's not even funny. The way he smiles into the mirror and then just gets up. Many clowns enjoy putting a wide variety of symbols on their face and I think it's all right as long as it doesn't detract. Try not to let your face become too busy. Don't let your face become too busy. I hope I followed the rules. I hope this isn't too busy. I don't know, I like it. The function of the sad-faced clown can be seen as the one who evokes care. 
Yeah, this is unfortunately a subtype of clown character. And um, I don't think it'd be very popular today. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Palm Sunday. I think that as we reflect on the meaning of Palm Sunday, it's important for us to pause and think about the reason that we celebrate. Jesus came riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. People came to greet him, waving palm branches. His disciples had warned him not to go. You see, Jesus knew... Sir? Sir? Yes, you? What are you doing here? Don't you know this is the house of the Lord? Look at you, you're filthy, your clothes are atrocious. Well, the least you could do is go back and sit in the back of the church where you belong. Sir? Sir? I wonder if any of us here would really know Jesus if he appeared here in our church on Palm Sunday. Hmm, I wonder. So the interruption can be a very powerful style of clowning when it's not used too often. Can you imagine going to church and this shit happens? When clowns put on makeup for the first time, they often act as if they're hiding behind a mask. I've found that throughout the years, quite the opposite is true. When clowns put on makeup, they very often become closer to their real self. If not their real self, perhaps an exaggeration of it or the kind of self they would like to be. It's kind of beautiful. I think that once more reinforces the idea that Christian clowning is not always what you're doing, but who's under the makeup and why you're doing it. Something's going on, and that something is a relationship. And that relationship opens up all kinds of possibilities for service and teaching in the way that Jesus Christ went about doing it, lifting people up, holding them up to new possibilities, holding them up to new opportunities. Because as we begin to get it together in clown ministry, we begin to discover some things about ourselves. We begin to discover things about others. And even if we stopped at this particular point, we could call it clown ministry and it would have value. Good news, like I said. Um, now, this is just me putting two and two together, okay. So I found a news clip that was about Floyd Schaefer talking about Christian clowning that we watched not too long ago, remember? It was kind of blurry. And that led me back to the YouTube page of what I believe to be either his church or like affiliations of his church. I don't know if this guy is still alive. I, I hope so. Um, it's the YouTube page for Kitamakwandi Community Church, otherwise known as KC Church. A non-denominational community of faith that welcomes everyone, whoever you are, and however you got here. We are people of all races, sexual orientation, gender identity, and religious and political backgrounds. And they even have a pride flag. And the place is led by a female reverend. Hello! Um, and I have even further proof because they talk about, um, like, in their different like about me pages, the clowning ministry and how it's still going on. And yes, I did find some newer, they're not like from last week or nothing, but some newer clown ministry stuff on their YouTube page. This is so nice. And you know what? I did poke around and they had like, they had like Trump skit for so-and-so's birthday. And I was like, Trump skit. And I watched it and they were making fun of Trump. They even said a liberal church like this. This is amazing! What? We got gay clowns, we got woman reverends, we got activist nuns. I love, I fucking love Christian clowning. Like, praise the Lord, okay? All right, let's, let's do this thing. Now let's enter the modern era and see what the Christian clowning community is up to. Christian clown, hallelujah a ministry he says he was accidentally called into 15 years ago. You heard correctly, there is a ministry specifically geared to those who feel called 
into clowning. We went to a Sunday school convention and there was a fellow there who used to work for Huntley, um, Dave Dooley Millmine. He invited me to a clown ministry workshop at uh, Crossroads. Um, didn't want to go, but my pastor said, oh, I used to be a clown, I'll go with you. And I went, oh, I'm stuck. Um, I went and the first day I already had my wig, I had my nose, I, I had makeup. I was, I was hooked. So today Hal, or Hallelu as he's known in the clown world, is here at a Girl Guides camp retreat where he's sharing some of his clown secrets. You guys can uh, pass these around, let everyone have a chance to see them. They're my nose, they're, they're a clown nose. Do you find that your personality transforms, that you become a different person once you put on your, your outfit? I think my, my tone and my voice changes once I'm in costume. Um, there is that different persona. Performing at mainstream venues as well as Christian events, churches, vacation Bible schools, even going on missions trips, being Hallelujah is a lot of work. There are even clown associations and organizations where he is able to meet others in the field. But what exactly is a Christian clown, you might ask? And how is it different than any other clown in the business? You're not, you don't always have to be over the top funny and laugh. Um, you break down, you get, the laughs are always good, um, but you break, you're just trying to break down barriers between people and then hopefully open them up to a conversation about Christ or even planting a seed, mm -hmm. um, whatever that seed may be. You gotta give a view. If you're not giving a view, then the audience probably isn't really gonna get it. I think um, you could still be funny, you can still perform, but I think the, the performances that seem to be the best uh, are the ones that you're giving some of yourself. So um, being a Christian clown, I'm hoping I'm giving some of that Christian, that love, that joy that I have that Christ showed others, and that I'm showing it through some of the stuff that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So this is about Hallelujah the Clown. So I looked this guy up, Hallelujah the Clown, and he also plays Santa. Um, and he's actually from Canada, which is... I don't know where I was going with that. You know Canadians, you know, they love to clown. I've only been a clown since I came to Tyler. D. Kirkpatrick knows it's never too late to set out on a lifelong dream. She's retired, but the 76-year-old is busy getting ready for her next gig as Dee Dee the Clown. Kazam! <laughs> she sees this as an outlet to spread happiness despite life's obstacles. Her heart and mind stay focused on a pastor's message she heard as a child. If you have sin in your life and it's not forgiven, then you can't live in God's heaven. Not all Christian clowns are cool. Okay. Not all Christian clowns are open-minded. And kids will go with you when you're doing this little thing. Clowning isn't just a hobby, it's an opportunity to evangelize. So I began to study the Bible and I found ways to express my appreciation for what God did for me. Dee joined the ministry in 2012, still grieving the deaths of a son and two husbands. If people do not have a comfort and a counselor called the Holy Spirit, it would be very, very difficult to get through those. Okay, I feel bad now. She's a Christian clown because she's grieving the loss of her husband and son. The ministry's work takes clowns to church gatherings, mission trips, even natural disasters. Visits to prisons are another opportunity to reach families. Uh, some children are very, very upset. <clears throat> and I've seen one or two fathers uh, very upset when they had to be parted, but that's part of the part of the punishment. Okay, I, I, I don't like that. I want out of here. I'm, I'm renouncing my clown identity. Finishing touch, put the hat on. There is a serious side to Dee's work. She weaves in stories from the Bible, like the prodigal son from the Gospel of Luke and the Good Samaritan. You can make uh, spiritual lessons with balloons into hearts, into crosses, uh, if you are very, very good, you can make anything you want. Dee is finding new purpose in life through this opportunity to encourage others, doing her part by sharing faith with another generation. I don't have any fear of the future. Uh, as long as I'm doing and happy and busy, uh, that's what I think God wants me to do. Lane Lucky, East Texas News Weekend. Christian Clowns, what do we think about him? 
I like him. And obviously I'm very pro clown. And I think that the whole situation that of Christian clowns really brings a much needed levity to our otherwise dark and traumatic subject matter that we usually cover on this channel. Not only that, but it brings joy to Christianity. And some of those serious people need to laugh a little, okay? And I can understand why people would think that having a, a clown interrupting a serious worship service where you're worshiping the Lord to be offensive. I do get it. But I also think that if done in the right context, maybe after the sermon, it can be pretty life affirming. I mean, these clowns are just trying to cheer people up. They're, they're trying to help lonely people. They're trying to make you smile. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And it's not like these clowns are like performing baptisms. You know what I mean? Like they're doing balloon animals. I seriously can't be mad at any Christian who wants to express themselves through something they're passionate about, especially when it comes to religion. Like they're just combining their two favorite things, especially when you consider what some of these evangelical churches are doing with these like Broadway style musicals that they do for Christmas or these like super traumatic hell houses. I think that being a Christian clown is probably the least blasphemous thing you could do in that area. I don't know. I just really want people to be happy. And if that involves slapping white paint on your face and going dancing, then I don't see anything wrong with that. I mean, goths do it every day and they're famously the most happy subculture. Many Christian clowns are going out of their way to spend time with lonely and vulnerable people and just trying to make them laugh. Or sometimes they're doing Bible stories for kids. I don't see anything wrong with that. As for clown masses, that's not really up to me. Maybe if I was more religious, I would have more of an opinion, but I think as long as they keep it respectful, it should be fine. Hey guys, so I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I sure as hell did. Um, I didn't know any of this stuff and now I am so glad that I do. Other than that, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Um, and I hope you're being kind to each other and open-minded and just, you know, clown honoring. Uh, <laughs> James and I were recently at an indie wrestling show in St. Louis and a fan came up to us and gave us friendship bracelets. And mine says Fundy Fridays. I think James is probably says King James or Fundy Fridays. I don't know. He's in the other room. Um, but yeah, it's got the pride colors on it. And it was just super sweet and it was just really cool that they not only like said hi to us, but like took their time to make friendship bracelets and give them to us the next day. Like that just warmed my heart. And if you're watching, I still have it and I'm going to wear it in this episode and then I'm probably going to put it up on my wall. So Hello again, um, I just wanted to pop in and let you guys know that since the editing and filming of this video... I think I now officially have the largest collection of clown ministry books available because literally um, I got a three pack today from thrift books. And so now I officially have two copies of this one, the sequel to the original clown ministry book, uh, two more Floyd Schaefer books, and then of course the OG. So I don't know. I, I don't even think this is a brag because I don't think this is cool. Um, we got lots of good stuff coming up here pretty soon. Couldn't tell you when, but we got some good stuff coming up. Um, remember to consensually smash that like and subscribe button. Follow me on social media. And just have a very blessed and very silly day. I love you guys and I'll see you later. That brings us to the end of our class. I hope you enjoyed the experience, and I hope that you'll continue to grow in your clowning. Remember, you can bring joy and love to many people in Jesus' name and show God's love and acceptance. And besides that, it's fun. See you Tuesday. <laughs>